Nice. Uh, one more time. Thank you. Thank you. You are so welcome, and, and as Ivan wishes to thank you as well. So we're in this together. Yeah. yeah. Ready? Let's do it, babe. Tres, dos, uno. Hi, everybody. It's an honor to me. Uh, be today in the city of Burdeaux representing the Spanish graphic community and it's my duty to thank Greg Glassman for creating a sport that in my opinion is changing the world. Thank you Greg. You're very welcome. Um, I have uh, six questions that I um, recopulate for my um, partners and friends that uh, want to know about you. And uh, the first is uh, we all know the definition of CrossFit but it would be great to know what means CrossFit for Greg Plasman. Well, you know, I've had a, I had a, some of the community uh, voice their uh, disinterest in my cited over and over and over again line, but I'm gonna do it again, and I'm gonna keep doing it until everyone understands. But we as a community sit in unique possession of an elegant solution, so elegant it may be optimal to the world's greatest problem, that's chronic disease. And uh, that, is, that is really, really important. The, the significance of that couldn't be overstated. Couldn't be overstated. We've got runaway uh, uh, rates of uh, uh, chronic disease. It's getting worse. It's uh, accounting for somewhere between 70 to 90% of deaths right now. We don't know for sure. It, we, it, we can measure that 86% of the healthcare spend is going to chronic diseases, and it's all for naught. That, that doesn't need to be the case. And the problem is, is uh, refined carbohydrate, which is a, certainly a processed food. We're just talking about that. And uh, sedentarism, you know, not moving. And uh, we, have a, we have the perfect antidote to both. I mean, the, the community inspires people to move, and they motivate one another to start eating better. And we've got a loud enough voice and enough good science and scientists around now that we can work against the prevailing wisdom, the message that's wrong, that's coming out of our universities and our government that is telling us to eat all the carbs you want. It's the fat that you gotta worry about. We've got enough of a groundswell now and enough of a base of people that understand just what nonsense that is, that uh, it, it feels like a revolution in the making. You know, I don't, I don't think that we're going to be victorious and someday you won't find those things or people eating them, but uh, the number of people that can avail uh, the, for themselves the, the, the correct information is growing. We have the perfect tool and it happens right, right in your box. I, I, I have to say thank you because um, your definition of CrossFit of um, 100 um, words yes. is amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you. CrossFit has not stopped evolving in recent years and since its creation, which is what makes you the proudest and the least. Rephrase that. Let me hear that again. Yeah. Uh, CrossFit has not stopped evolving yes. years uh, and since its creation, uh, what makes you proudest and least. The focusing on this community that I call underserved, the morbidly obese and the elderly. It's, uh, these are two populations that a lot of lip service is paid to. Everyone talks about them a lot, but I don't think there's anyone doing anything really effectively, you know, it, out, of, out of traditional kind of, out of medicine, I don't see anything happening. I don't see it coming out of the universities, the hospitals don't have the answer. And in part because it doesn't become a medical problem until it's acute. The hospitals are full of these people, but something needed to happen before they got to the hospital, and that something happens, happens where we're at. But in terms of the evolution, you know, the website undertook a, a significant revision uh, this year. You know, we took the game stuff off the front and put it over in the games area, and the, the 
and the material now we've got science education and studies and we're, we're offering uh, uh, resources for the for the community and so the audience was kind of deliberately targeted 10-year affiliates um, the doctors that are in the boxes there's maybe as many as 40,000 physicians in CrossFit boxes. We have a pretty good sense that there are 20,000 in the U.S. and that's about half the affiliates. And so it may be that there are another 15 to 20,000 perhaps in, in the other gyms. But in making these changes in the appearance of CrossFit.com, I was telling staff that, that the evolution, the change, the revision, it's all in our heads because no one's gonna do anything different in the gym next year. They don't need to. In fact, if they did, it would, it would be less effective. But what we need to do is understand more clearly the significance of what we're doing. And it's hard for someone to, you, you have to be somewhat learned to appreciate Alzheimer's and diabetes and strokes and infarcts that don't happen, that never materialize. And we are in that business. And, but we do get to see it when you see the reversal. So when someone who is someone who's elderly and slouched over is now standing taller with shoulders back and head back and, 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 and clearly engaging you know, more with the outside world or someone who every time you see them, they're shrinking, they go from 400 to 350 to 300 to 250, going to ground and coming back up. That, that impacts everyone around them. And so we this year, year ago, um, put word out in the community that we were looking for these underserved people. And I specifically wanted morbidly obese and elderly people. First shot was, we almost launched a Facebook uh, request for uh, fat people and old people and stopped short of that. And the, the word we put out was, if you see yourself as the least likely person to do CrossFit, we want to talk to you. And we got a lot of fat and old people. They were like, yep, I'm too old for it, or I'm too big for it. And uh, we've got uh, just under 200 of them now, and they're in the Scotts Valley gym every, every morning, and uh, we've got several classes a day. And boy, that's, a, that's, a, that's an eye-opener, you know? Nothing new, but you know the different levels on which you know something. You can kind of know something, and then you can just live it, feel it, breathe it, see it. And I think that's been good for everyone. Uh, no, the, 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 the evolution is, lies in, in our coming to terms with the importance of what we're doing, that this isn't just a sport, you know, um, football is a very popular sport, whether you're talking about American or European, <laughs> right? Very, very big, very popular. But uh, let me, let me just stick with our American football, um, <laughs> uh, you know, we have more than good reason to suspect that this isn't the healthiest thing in the world, right? I mean, if you've heard about the yeah. CTE issue. By the way, the, the gal that works that, uh, has done that research, that work as a crossfitter, which is pretty cool. But this uh, traumatic encephalopathy uh, is there, it's a, it's a problem. But even if a sport makes kids fit, um, what we're doing is, by the, by the participation, uh, is unprecedented. You know? I don't know. Now, is there is there a, a football or soccer program for uh, for morbidly obese people or the elderly? I would guess not. I would guess not. And so it's a spectator sport with a lot of kids that play it, right? And we got something different. We got something different, you know. Yeah. And if you showed me someone that weighed, you know. 200 kilos, my first thought isn't that they, they need to play football, you know? <laughs> or, but if they said, hey, I think I'd like to, I would encourage it, yeah, you know, anything. We'll kick the ball around, I'll walk with you, you know? Um, the best to pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly what we'll do in, in your gym tomorrow. The, let me share one thing that's like, you know, we've all seen burpees and we know about burpees and I don't use burpees in the gym. Um, I've had, three or four good back tweaks of otherwise healthy people doing burpees. Doing burpees. Mm -hmm. And that happened over about a six month period. It's like the fourth or fifth guy I got now who's, who's got some kind of sciatic reference, you know, he's, we've clearly got a, got a 
got a lumbar spine injury here. And I identified it in people that were not flexible enough to land mm -hmm. with their back arched. So, and they would do is with a rounded back, thud into the ground and tweak is, the, is my operating theory. And so I, I didn't use them. Now I know they're in the games, they love them. And so fine, but I didn't use them in my clinical practice. Um, I sure am with our underserved, but they're not coming up with violent force and they, and they lack the flexibility. But but the, the beauty of the burpee is that it's training for two um, uh, horrific moments in, the, in, a, in a senior's uh, life. And one is the accidental fall, and then the compounded issue is, is the down but can't get up. Yeah. And there have been, people have, have fallen to the ground, received minor injuries, and then laid there for three days, unable to get up, and that turns into a, into a nightmare. You know, it's a, it, it, could be, it can be life ending. And so here we are in a controlled environment, getting people to willfully, deliberately go to ground, prone out, and then begin the journey back up to their feet. And one of the ladies that did that in the gym, uh, she came in originally with, uh, with a walker, mm -hmm. and then she had two canes. And going to ground wasn't an option. And so we had a 40-inch plyo box, I think it was a big one. And she would just um, prostrate herself, prostrate herself over the box, just lean down, get her belly and arms and head onto the box and then push back up and get her walker and come to standing again. And we went to a shorter box, a shorter box, a shorter box. And lo and behold, within uh, six months and maybe 75 pounds of weight loss, she, for the first time in 11 years, went to ground willfully and got back up. And now she does that just as a matter of course. Now, you talk about you know, evolution and seeing things. I mean, I mean that, that changes the burpee for me forever. <laughs> in my head, it's okay. So it's a thing we see the games athletes do. It's a good way to hurt your general population, and it's the most important thing that you could teach someone who's morbidly obese or senior. Yeah, and uh, it's. Uh, I don't know of anything like that, by the way. It doesn't work in the middle, but it does on both <laughs> ends. But it's cool, and it, I do believe it to be a fact. And develop the mindset. Like, do, do, do a burpee. You know, your mindset is uh, growing because you can push uh, every day one more, or you can. Um, use in your life, the mindset that you learn about in CrossFit. You know, I, I asked this gal, she said, I haven't been to the ground willfully and gotten back up in 11 years. And I go, how do you remember the date? She goes, well, because the fireman had to kick my door down <laughs> and pick me up and put me on the couch. And I was like, oh yeah, I, you would remember that. You know, and I was just like, I didn't, I wasn't prepared for that, you know, and I should have been, but I am now, I get it, I get it. So you remember what a horrible thing it would be to be living by yourself and to know that if you get down on the ground, you've got a big problem. I can't imagine that. It's terrifying. Uh, okay. You got the answer though, Renzo. <laughs> Greg, um, oftentimes you're wearing a shirt that said uh, unbelievable. Um, where are the principles of Greg Glassman? Well, I'll tell you what, they're not, they're not tied in any way, shape or form to money. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, Excited by money, I'm not. Uh, it was nice because I'm, I'm wealthy, but um, I'm no I'm no happier than I was when I when I was poor. And I have uh, friends close to me that don't hesitate to tell me what they really think. They told me that I haven't changed at all. And so the unbiable thing was was a powerful message to uh, yeah. to a, a, an attempt at a hostile takeover of the business that this wasn't for sale. At the time, I said that anything that creates this much health and wealth, and for me, the wealth was not, not my salary, but, but the 15,000 um, professional trainers in the training space that are independent owner operators of a gym, that's, that's really exciting, you know? And uh, what we've got a, a training cadre now, I think the number's probably 150, 175,000 trainers that have been through the L1 program. And I'm going to say that probably half of those are are actively involved in in uh, earning their living through that through that effort, maybe more. But that's a uh, that's you know I'm, I'm proud of that, yeah. proud of that those opportunities. My experiences with my affiliates have taught me, and I get to go to Harvard Business School every year now, and 
surprise them with my take that business is the art and science of providing uniquely attractive opportunities for other people. Uh, uniquely attractive is evidenced by what? They avail themselves of that opportunity, they take it. Um, uniquely attractive, they chose what you're offering and not something else, and other people, that's pretty clear what that means too, not for me, but for others. In being in Santa Cruz for so long, which is a, a bedroom community of the, of the Silicon Valley, I, I had uh, two or three billionaire clients, famous named clients, and I know Lauren had a few as well. And I'm gonna share with you that it was really neat to, to spend a lot of good time, personal time with these, with these men and, and one woman, and uh, they were not motivated by money. They're not, that, that would be a tremendous misunderstanding. I have a friend who's a serial billionaire, he's made a billion, spent it all, made a billion, spent it all, he just keeps getting filthy rich and then get as broke as fast as he can. And uh, uh, his thing is, is code, and it's not, it's, and when he writes successful code that's got more lines and works with less glitches and errors than yours, um, it, it, it's crazy stimulating to him. It's for him proof that he's smarter than the other guys. And that's not, I don't know, I wouldn't say that's noble, but it isn't the same as the money. It just happens though that if you can write code that has fewer lines and works more efficiently, um, you will get rich for doing that. And that's what he liked was the, was the, was the, the code. And I'm gonna tell you that, uh, that uh, I think that's what's behind. Uh, now I know I know there's kind of a West Coast in the states. There's a West Coast East Coast kind of divide in business types, and uh, uh, the entrepreneurial kind of technical uh, all those people out west, particularly in the, in the California economy. Um, very few of those people seem to me to be motivated by money. I think that, I think that would be a misapprehension. So that's all the unviable thing is. I don't think my affiliates are trying to get rich. I don't know if you can get rich running a gym, you know? But but look, you know, my doctor over here didn't go to medical school to make money. She went to medical school to, to, to cure and heal sick kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's, a, that's a, a noble profession, an important profession, and you'll do very well financially. And that's, you know, there's a, there's a lot there. That's a, I think, I think doing something important and being able to feed your kids is, is half of life. Greg, uh, what advice would you give yourself but find it hard to listen? I am, by temperament, um, uh, uh, cynical and by intellect I'm a skeptic and I keep having to ratchet up my cynicism because things are so much fucking worse than you could ever believe I'm just I, I just I I can't get over it how bad things are and so we're all reading rigor mortis and uh, I'm in my third or fourth read of it I'm gonna memorize that book <laughs> but uh, and we've, we've got there there are dozens of those books maybe hundreds there's a whole genre now of of whistleblowers, people, you know, refugees from medicine stepping away and telling just how bad things are. And uh, uh, I'm surprised that I keep being surprised at how, how rotten things are. One of the things that keeps surprising me is, is when we find scientific misconduct for cash, um, it's amazing how little money's given. That people sell out so cheap, ten thousand dollars. You get a guy to not write that sugar was. It wasn't even that much. It was uh, adjusted for inflation. Maybe it was, but uh, we had two scientists out of Harvard for a couple thousand bucks each, changed their sugar research in heart disease and turned it into fat, and then had the gall to type that up and send it. You know, mail. You know, traditional mail back and forth. And the archives of the, of that exchange was found recently. And uh, I was surprised that I was surprised by it, but I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be. Yeah, you can't. It, the the a good part of our trainer education is going to be to increase the skepticism of the of the trainer. 
And uh, just because you hear something in the New York Times or wherever else, any local paper, it doesn't mean it's true. Just because it came out of a university, it doesn't mean it's true. Yep. We were speaking earlier before we started about the importance for the community to recognize the serious, serious limitations of observational studies. The epidemiology's favorite trick in the book is is fundamentally not not really science. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that the um, the world is changing and people uh, open more their eyes and now can uh, can check that no there are not only a truth there there are more different truths because because the uh, every person is is different. We have we have embraced, I don't mean the CrossFit community, but the world, the universe has embraced some theories about metabolism and health that don't comport with clinical reality. And one of the, our jobs at, at CrossFit is to uh, let everyone know that uh, um, a theory that doesn't, doesn't bear out, that doesn't, doesn't work, it's okay to reject it. And we've all seen enough in the gym now that we understand what it what you do to someone to improve their health, you know. And it doesn't look like a low-fat diet. And the carbs aren't unlimited. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Greg, um, have you you know you don't Spain doesn't have a lot of fat people like America. No, but uh, we have. Some, like, you get, are you yeah. getting some now? Yeah. Yeah. Not bad, but Definitely, we have. Yeah. Uh, have you had? Has someone lost a hundred pounds in your gym? Mm, no, no. Yeah. Have, um, Maybe not 50 kilos, but yeah, we have obese people, obese kids. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See that now. That's Always interesting. Different. Yeah. It's gonna change. The kids is more near. Uh, yeah. yeah. Of, of, uh, One of the best ways to be a fat adult is to be a fat kid. Yeah. It's a great start. Yeah. That's interesting. Great. Uh, the last one. If you so this may be the first generation of fat children. Second, third? Yeah, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Third, 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 third. yeah. That is not, that is not, uh, a very uh, good sign. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> definitely. That, that's got a bad look to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Greg, if you could make people understand a message or a concept, what concept would it be? Um, well, my current kick is trying to educate people on what modern science is and exactly. the scientific method. And we're building curriculum around that and talking with, with, with wizards in that, in that field of, of, of science and science education. And uh, we've been at that so a while. We had a, developed a course for uh, uh, explaining and teaching basic science that we played with a, a decade ago and actually had a first offering of it in uh, Austin, I believe it was, in 2009. But if you go to, I think my dates are the right, but if you put in Jeff Glassman, um, science, skepticism into Google, that CrossFit Journal article appears, and there's an audio tape of a, a, a 70, 80 minute lecture, and uh, uh, it was a dry one. We, you know, we, we were just experimenting with the concept and a slide deck that goes along with that. And uh, we're, we've brought that material out and we're dusting it off and preparing to launch an, a certification, um, a, a, a course on modern science and the scientific method. And uh, that's, that's exciting for me to get that across because you don't, you don't have to have much science education to, to uh, uh, make yourself more comfortable with the fact that what you're teaching in the gym flies in the face of what most people believe. You know, and so when people come to you with these studies that show that eating red meat increases your risk of colon cancer by 28%, um, we have the tools to explain that this is an observational study based on a questionnaire. The survey method is, is uh, not held in high regard, is a, is a method for collecting data that's measurable, observable, or repeatable. It's not really an estimation of the of the real world, but of your survey itself and all your assumptions that come after that should be about survey and not eating necessarily. Um, that's just bad science, and there's so much of that, so much of that. I'd like to. I think we would we would benefit from 
teaching uh, people to ignore these observational studies, to not accept them. They won't quit coming, and you can, you can, easiest thing in the world to fudge. I would expect a lot of them to, to be, to, uh, it seems like a prime thing to, uh, to alter the data on. The, the, the falsification, fabrication, it seems ripe for that kind of study. Now, I go there because we of CrossFitters have been victims of fabrication and falsification and seeing the ease with which a editor-in-chief of a peer-reviewed journal, William Kramer, National Strength Conditioning uh, uh, Research Journal, what is it called? Strength, Strength, journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, yes. William Kramer, editor-in-chief. We actually get, have the emails where he's suborning the falsification of data and, and the, the young investigators dutifully complied and made up, made up injury data, you know? And so do I think that, that uh, the food industry would hire scientists that would, at the end, start playing with the numbers until you got the, the right result? Of course that's happening, of course that's happening. I, you know, this scientific misconduct thing isn't new for us. We, with Russ and, and the whole team, the whole assault team, um, went after Gatorade and the uh, uh, hyperhydration and the shitty thermoregulatory science that had been American College of Sports Medicine had published. And we were able to, to get the right scientists together and brought also the people that had written this shitty science and got them all in a room. And the people that had created the bad science for the American College of Sports Medicine weren't willing to stick to their crappy beliefs in front of these uh, physicians that came out of Harvard, Georgetown, University of Virginia. I mean, we had, we had, the, we had there on our side um, the Dean of Medicine at the University of Virginia, who was also chair of the Department of Nephrology. And uh, he had written extensively on the, on the hyperhydration fraud in peer-reviewed journals, but to no effect. And so we brought him out, and at the end, we got a consensus, which is, you know, whatever consensus is worth. I have, I have no respect for consensus, but the scientific community likes to write consensus papers, so we, they put one together, and the end result was uh, drink when you're thirsty, don't when you're not. Mm -hmm. and, well, that's, and that's some straightforward stuff right there. That cost us millions of dollars to do, and realize in the end that we could lose the war winning battles in that fashion. So I'm gonna have to get to hire scientists and bring people in to pee when you feel like you gotta go and don't when you don't, <laughs> and take a shit when you feel like you got to and don't when you don't, take a deep breath when you think you need one and you know, and don't when you, like, I did three million a pop, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. But I did, when I saw the, uh, the uh, uh, JSCR, uh, Divorce Smith study on CrossFit, I knew on, on first inspection that it was fraudulent. That what they didn't have is the people that leave and don't come back because they don't want to exercise. And that always happens. And they didn't have any of those. So I'm like, no, that's weird. But you got hurt people. And I go, nah, I've had hurt people, but I've had way more walk than hurt. Way more walk than hurt. And so I call bullshit on it. And, but I, I came to find out that it was, you know, there were no injuries in the study, and that's how it was turned in. They reported no injuries. And William Kramer told me, you can't publish it without injuries. Hmm. So they came back and got some. Then we brought Latham Watkins into uh, Ohio, Columbus, Columbus. and uh, interviewed, they deposed every, everyone involved in the study, all of the subjects, and that had never been done before. No one had ever taken a peer-reviewed journal and taken all of the experimental subjects and interviewed them to see if what happened in the study happened to them. And it didn't. It didn't. Every, every, every single one of them said, I didn't get hurt on CrossFit. We always have the, the, the emails from the NSCA bragging about people interpreting. The, there, were, there were some that had prior injuries, and they're talking to one another, well, look, they're going to think that CrossFit caused them. More scientific misconduct. The lies, that, that group of people, not, look, I only know about this field because it's in my field, but the science in my field is marked by fraud. It, it, it otherwise is the exception. Yeah. 
It's amazing. It's an amazing thing. I sit here, I'm sitting here right now, genuinely amazed that, that, it, that that's the case, but it is. It is. Greg, um, I don't know if, if it's possible, because um, I don't know if you speak Spanish, but uh, the community of Spain... Muy poquito. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Can I have some water with tea? <laughs> I'll what? try. I'll be... Okay. Do <laughs> <laughs> you want to try send a message in Spanish for the like, like, Hola. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for example, um, uh, uh, yo soy Greg Glassman y saludo a la comunidad española. Hola. Eh, hola a todos los CrossFit España. Hola, hola a todos CrossFit España. Yeah. Nice. Okay, um, we finish here. Uh, thank you. You're yes. so welcome. It's a great opportunity. It's a dream for me because um, I follow your work uh, since a lot of years. And for, one, for me, it's, it's one of your Pe Pedro, you've been doing my work all these years. <laughs> you know, you've been following my work. You've been doing it. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't train very many people. I do get into the, our our little group, you know, downstairs and hang with them and render advice. Um, but uh, you're doing all you're doing all the work, and I'm I'm acutely aware of that. And I I I lead. Um, because you allow me to, and so and so. Thank you. Thank you. Oof. When's the last time you were in California? Uh, my last time in California is uh, last year. Uh, the, uh, I I was in Santa Fe uh, just one year ago.